All right, guys, real quick, we got a <laughs> we got a rainy Saturday out here. Uh, as soon as I said that, look out, there's a groundhog and a deer running by. That's funny. But anyway, uh, so, you know, usually Sundays on, you know, those rainy, rainy Sundays is where I talk about comics and stuff. But I uh, got plans tomorrow, which is taking me out of town. And I think I'm doing a live show on, I think, a channel called Mind the Comics on V for Vendetta with a few other people. Uh, uh, maybe check on Twitter if you have me on Twitter for that if it happens. And then I'll probably be coming to you live from a hotel room if we do that. Uh, i tell you what, I have done more living in the last week than I think I have done in the last six months. And this last week has felt like, you know, a year in a good way, right? So when I woke up this morning, I was so freaking tired, I didn't feel it. I'm so jacked up and high from it. Uh, I mean, I'm hearing from, it just, I can go on and on, man, but, but my mouth wouldn't work. So I would have had this out earlier, but uh, I was so tired that when I got my first phone call this morning, my mouth wasn't working. It was hilarious, right? Now, I have a lot of new viewers since I've actually sat down and done an actual comic book review, I guess, in a way. So just to kind of put out there, what I try to do is talk about the work, reference the author. I like I like work to stand on its own. I'm going to be talking about Dark Knight, uh, a true Batman story by Paul Denny. So this isn't shots at Paul Denny. I'm interpreting the work. This is how I look at it. Um, so let's just talk about it because I usually don't really bash too many books every now and then, right? But I got to tell you, I was highly disappointed with this one. This came out, I think, about uh, sometime in the last year or two. And I've kept an eye on it. It's a hardback one shot. But Paul Denny is the author of a lot of cartoons you probably watched in the 80s and 90s and up till today. He's done, he's dabbled in comics. He helped create Harley Quinn. He's probably most famous for uh, creating Harley Quinn on the Batman, the animated series. And for what was it, Heart of Ice or something? The Emmy Award winning episode of the Batman animated series uh, with Mr. Freeze. So when I, when I read it, when I knew this was coming out, I was like, I am so in. I've loved it. 99% of the stuff this guy's put out. So what he's what he's done is that he's told a true tale of when he was mugged in the early 90s. My two guys beaten brutally. And he actually was sort of, I wouldn't say hallucinations. I'm not quite sure what to, what to get in here with, uh, with what he was doing. But uh, he was definitely having Batman villains kind of torment him a little bit. And Batman's coming in there. And this was kind of told to us that this was how Batman got him through it and stuff. And it's the furthest from the truth, right? Batman is actually probably the reader <laughs> in this thing, and you'll see why in a minute. Now, uh, as I read this and stuff, I probably went in with some expectations of, like, I was going to get the story. This was going to be the intimate story of Paul Denny opening up, and it's going to be kind of therapeutic. But actually, this thing, I, I want to go with unreliable narrator. Let's put it that way. When I hear true story, I'm expecting a true story. This thing actually read like a wannabe Harvey P. Carr meets a wannabe Salinger catcher in the rye, and it fails miserably. I mean, it really does and stuff, right? But we come in there, and, and there's so many things that, before we get into the story, Paul Denny kind of does to disarm us in this story, at least for me. I'm a social worker. I've, I've seen people in therapy. I've dealt with people in therapy. I've linked people up with therapies and things like that, so I can kind of see some indicators of, of bullshit when I see it. Doesn't mean it is, this is just a story. But to me, I'm gonna compare this book with a, a, a Neil Young album called Everybody's Rockin', it came out around 83, I think. And if you go and look at it, the cover of that album, Neil Young is dressed in a rockabilly outfit, and he's got some throwback songs that sound like they're from a different era. And what really happened behind the scenes with that album is that David Giffen Record Company got a hold of Neil Young and they thought they were going to get Harvest, his big album in 73. They were going to get a Harvest. And they didn't feel like Neil was delivering, so they started getting on him saying, we want a rock and roll album. I want something like Harvest. I want a rock and roll album. So Neil Young was like, yeah, I'll give you a rock and roll album. And it was like a joke. It's a joke album. And But what they did, what the, what the Giffen Records spin people did to market this thing is, I remember seeing it, they put a big label on it and says, Neil Young bravely goes back into history and goes to the roots of rock and roll to explore. And I'm just sitting here like, oh, it's such bullshit. And that's what this feels like. I feel like DC was going to get a big Paul Denny story. We're going to get Paul Denny talking about his mugging and Batman. We're going to have something great here. Then they got it, and they had to market it like, Paul Denny bravely goes back in time and explores his mugging that tragically affected his life. 
and it's the brave story of a soul coming out of the hole. No, 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 furthest from the truth, man. So this book kind of opens up with Paul Denny showing us as a kid in the 60s, and he talks about his love of cartoons, and he automatically kind of labels himself an outsider to the point that his family puts him in therapy. Okay, great, it's the 60s and stuff. But he also kind of shows us that it was probably his own, it, he, it was kind of his own fault. He he wasn't really even trying they were shown. He was acting like everybody was bullying them, everybody was coming after him, and his only friends were the cartoons like Benny and Cecil and stuff, and there's some artwork showing that, him as a kid and stuff, and or his only friends, like he actually sees them. That's why I'm like, this has got to be an unreliable narrator and stuff, and little bits and pieces of the family being like, uh, you know, you might want to kind of man up here a little bit or do this or get, what, what's cartoons going to do to pay off. And he acts like he's won because he ended up writing cartoons. Now I'm going to give him that man, because I just, just about a month or two ago, you know, I kind of posted some stuff about seeing Avengers infinity war. And I think I put it on my reaction after, right after seeing the movie and stuff that, collecting comics all these years to make it, you know, since the late 70s to make it to Infinity War and see what I'm seeing on the screen, one of my buddies sat there and said, we won, right? So fine, we'll, we'll get through with that, right? But I don't know if Paul Denny is being extremely open or if he's just not self-aware or if he's given us his skewed interpretation of reality. Like I said, when I hear a true story, I'm thinking we're getting a true story here, but he kind of comes off uh, very self-loathing and very condescending, and everybody's stupid, you know. And that, that really kind of throws you off here. You can't relate or feel for him. Mean, he had a hook, you know. I was a kid in therapy, and I love cartoons. I'm one of you in this hobby and comic books and stuff, right? But he's such an unlikable character in this. I don't know if he's really like that in real life, or is this his interpretation of what he thinks to of himself, right? And he's always acting like he's going for unattainable women, and he kind of comes off like he's shallow, and, you know, he just wants them because they're hot, and he's a big-time writer, and he knows Steven Spielberg, and these actress women are only going out with him, uh, and they think he really knows just to meet Spielberg and stuff. And that's what happened. He was trying to get into the head of one of these girls and make her jealous one night, and was he started going down a road trying to act like he had somewhere better to be and was hoping she was think he was thinking of some other girl. And he gets jumped by these two guys with rings and they beat him brutally and he thinks he's going to die. It's horrific. I don't want that to happen to anybody. But you can't feel for the guy. By the time you get that point in the story, it happens to be the exact opposite reaction. You have this, this thing where you're just sort of like beat him into a man. Even if you don't think that way, you're just sort of like, you're not feeling for the guy. He comes off very shallow and empty. I, I don't want to say what you've heard about like Hollywood and stuff, you know, being fake and stuff, but um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Either this man is very self-loathing or he's bullshitting us. So he goes through even, he gets a little bit of self-awareness in here saying that there's been people who's been through worse stuff, you know, very admirable, right? But is it real? I, I don't know. I just feel like, I just don't feel like this is sincere. I don't feel like he's really being honest with us. What I think he's really done with this book is that in the middle of this, after showing us things like when he was beat brutally and he had a, he, he, he got beat so bad that some uh, bones in his face were crushed to nothing, so they had to put a steel plate in. But after he got beat, he looks in the mirror and he sees Two-Face looking at him. I mean, it's some of the stuff, that, that some of the things to where he's able to connect the villains with his thoughts just for a few panels is genius. I mean, it's there. It's, it's really cool. We needed more of that because that's what this was marketed as. But when he's looking in the mirror, he sees Two-Face coming in. That's how he feels. That's what he feels like he looks like and Two-Face is talking to him and then Joker torments him. Then you have Batman sitting there saying, this was kind of your fault. You're, you know, you, you could have manned up. You could have fought. You could have done this. You know, you could have not gone down that. You could have been self-aware. And he tries to have a tit to for tat bat with Batman. So Batman ends up coming, becoming this guy like, you know, you need, you need to get up and do something. You need to take some martial arts. You need to do this. You need to do that. You know, get in shape, do anything. He's pretty much telling him how to improve his life. And he's just like, well, I'm not a billionaire like you. I mean, it's so smug and condescending. It's like, it's like Paul Denny doesn't realize he's wrong about taking responsibility for himself and his health and stuff, right? So you just don't feel for the guy. When, when these things happen, it's very hollow um, in this book. Now, what, after I read this book, and 
looked at it as a whole, there's a scene in here where when he finally pulls himself out of the depression a little bit and goes back to work, and he had the support of a lot of people at the studio wanting him to come back and giving him time, and he finally kind of gets it to go back. Maybe Batman said something to him. By this time, you're just not invested, right? So he gets back, and, and he does this proposal for what I think really is real of what could have been in the Batman animated series. He had a story with Neil Gaiman, Sandman, and Death in here, and you get to see the two-page pitch. I honestly think this book was written as a way for him to, to get that story out there and kind of one-up everybody for not letting them put it out in the animated series. They wouldn't let a character named Death be on a kid's cartoon show, right? It's actually a very... that the I would have rather had the comic book form of that animated series with Batman and Death and Sandman... The, in in the Bruce Tim style in a comic book than, than this thing, right? It was so bad. But then we have the moment where you're like, you just have to call the bullshit where you see the bullshit, right? I'm going to go ahead and say I don't believe him. There, there's too many indicators here, right? And this is where I'm saying he turns into a poor man's Harvey Picard. When the when the Joker is talking to him one time, he, he, he looks at him, he's like, yeah, I still see the scars. So we get a flashback of the night that the Batman animated series crew won an Emmy. And supposedly Paul Denny had gone home because he was stood up by some girl, couldn't even get a girl to come to the Emmys with him, um, didn't show up. So he goes home and he took the Emmy and he started cutting every part of himself in the mirror that he didn't like. Do I believe he cut himself and stuff? Yes, I do, right? It took, cutting is a release. I've worked with people who are cutters. I've talk to them. I've had them try to explain it to me and stuff, right? That may be why, that may be why I'm a little bit cold towards him about how he portrayed it in this, because he's saying he got his, he took his clothes off, was in his boxers looking at the mirror and took the Emmy and started cutting himself. Well, how fucking dramatic and attention seeking in that? Like I said, uh, you know, if he's a cutter, I hope he gets help and all this stuff. I hope he's had the help, but portray that in, to portray that in here in this book his book, his story, his right, but you've labeled it true story. Come on, right? So that's pretty much how I, f I kind of feel about it. I kind of built the story up in my head. I take some responsibility, and I think I was expecting something completely different, but I think DC got stuck with a stinker, and they just got it out, and that's why we really haven't heard about it anymore, <laughs> you know? Oh, my God, right? Keep on rocking. Be excellent to each other. Later.